Hello again. This is Matthew 1120 coming to you from the College of DuPage and the title of this lecture is More Midterm Preparation Collateral and Such. You just turned in a low stakes assessment. I think we called it number seven and this is uh, what it was. So I wanted to share a solution with you uh, for this. So we're to find a confidence interval and so first we have to find uh, X bar and we also have to find the standard deviation associated with this first sample. And we also have to look at the T table to see what is the critical value and we find it's 2.023. So that means using our formula, the lower bound is um, the X bar minus, this is gonna be T um, alpha over two. Uh, times there's a standard deviation divided by the square root of 40. We get that for the lower bound. Similarly, we get this for the upper bound. So the way we state this is we are 95% confident. The mean number of shares of PepsiCo traded uh, per day was between that number and this number of millions of shares. Now in part C, they asked you to construct a second one from a second sample. And so we do that. The calculations follow very similar. One thing that is the same is there's still our 40 um, data points there, and the cutoff critical value is the same. Other things are different because it's a different sample. So we get this for the lower bound and this for the upper bound. And again, we would say we're 95% confident the mean number of shares traded was between the lower bound and the upper bound, and those are millions of shares. The confidence intervals are different because of variation in sampling. The samples have different means, and the standard deviations lead to different confidence intervals. Along the way, I ask you a question, how many people do you have to get in a room before the probability of a matching birthday is more than 50%? And you're to assume randomly selected people, so there are independent events about the birthdays. And further, I ask you to assume that there are 365 days in a year and that every day is equally likely. Uh, for baby to be born on every day. The key to doing this problem is to realize that the probability of at least one matching birthday is one minus the probability of no matching birthdays. And this is pretty easy to compute. So if there's one person, the probability of no matching birthdays is one. There's no one to match with, and that means the probability of having at least one matching is zero. If we go to the next one, however, uh, what happens is the only thing we have to worry about is we can't match with this first person. So that is going to be, that person does have a birthday. So there are 364 divided by 365 is the probability of not matching. That's what this number is. And then this is 1 minus that. When we go to 3, what happens is this person can't match with this person's birthday and this person's birthday. But that means there's 363 days out of 365 that we could have here. But then this is going to be one minus that and so on and so forth. And if I were to write a program, I could um, write the program this way. I'm recognizing that I'm going to be multiplying the new factor times the previous thing in the entry because none of those were matching. So if I were um, clicking formulas in Excel, these would be the formulas I'd use. But you go through the calculation and you're doing the calculation and what happens is the probability of no matching birthdays becomes less than one half. And so that means this becomes over one half. The answer is 23. A lot of students find that surprising. I note in passing that there are 23 full-time math faculty at the College of DuPage and I do have a matching birthday with someone. Uh, there was um, a problem that I gave you about uh, trying to figure out if something is normal or not. In fact, the SN in my own head stood for skewness and normal. So that's what this assessment was about. And I gave you a data set, and I will give you data sets for you to play with also. So you want to know how to do that uh, for the midterm. Uh, I asked you to draw a histogram, and what did that tell you about the skewness? And what did that tell you about it maybe being from a normal distribution? Look at a box plot. What did that tell you? Again, these are things I might ask you on the um, exam. I asked you to use Pearson's second coefficient for skewness to find the coefficient. And what does that tell you? 
and then I ask you to use a formula in Excel to figure out what that is. And then I ask you to you, uh, compare it with the empirical rule. And so in summary, what do they, all these things tell you about whether it comes from a normal distribution or not? Well, your histogram should look like this, and that's pretty symmetric. And so it's not perfectly normal, but it's a sample, and that's reasonably symmetric. Um, the box plot looks even more symmetric um, than that. Um, and if we uh, calculate the skewness here, now, to calculate the skewness, we have to find the uh, median and the mean. And so I go through calculations with the median and the mean. Um, and I find that the, um, uh, so I can calculate these. But what we see here is those numbers are both pretty close to uh, zero, which means it's there's not much skewness happening here. And then I find out what the mean is of this uh, this. Uh, uh, distribution and I compare it with the median and I uh, also calculate the mean plus one standard deviation and the mean plus two standard deviations I, I computed that uh, somewhere and that's not hard to compute and so then what we said is well how many of those data points and I sorted them from top to bottom how many are within one standard deviation how many are with two standard deviation and how many are within three standard deviation now this is what the empirical rule will tell us we should have and that's what we have so it's not a bad fit at all. So the conclusion is, yeah, this is probably normal. We also did a problem uh, dealing with the Titanic, and we looked at uh, two slices of this in contingency tables. One was the survivors and those who perished uh, across men, women, boys, and girls. And then we also look at the people that survived and perished, uh, depending on uh, how much they paid to go on the, on the ship third class being cheaper, second class and first class. And then we also had statistics on the crew. So I said make a frequency and relative frequency charts. Um, I ask you, okay, what does this say about women and children first? Uh, did the crew actually stay back and help the people or did they save themselves? Uh, what happened was there discrimination across the, you know, the ticket prices of them? And looking at the small number, could you make any other suggestion? So here was what you got when you computed the frequency and the relative frequency um, tables. And so um, that tells us a, a lot of things. And so those were the calculations I was asking you to do. Uh, women and children were not first. If they had been truly first, all of them could have been saved. Because if you add up the women and children, it's less than the 706 that would, were saved by putting them into life bolts. So, um, no, it was not exclusively uh, done. Uh, let's see, another question was, um, there were 1324 passengers. Now, a bunch of them were crew. Um, and so, if possible, um, to save all of them, uh, we wouldn't have saved all of them because you could only save... 706 but that would have say if you were saving passengers first no crew would have been saved so some crew didn't go down with the ship and probably chose not to yes there was discrimination if you look at the percentages uh at the um first class 60 percent were saved second class 42 and the third class 24 percent and the crew also had 23 percent which is almost like the third class passengers um, in terms of the small numbers, uh, they were sailing with way less lifeboats than they really should have had. And also we have indications they didn't load the lifeboats very well. So both equipment and processes were not adequate on the Titanic. I also asked you a problem, uh, a different problem about baseball. I gave you this file from the baseball season 2017. And it talked about wins, losses, runs scored on average, and runs allowed on average. This is a measure of offense. This is a measure of defense. I ask you a bunch of questions. Uh, so construct a histogram showing the average run scored for all the teams. Ask you if it was symmetric or skewed. Um, I ask you to compare the average run scored by the American League and National League teams. Does there seem to be a difference and why? 
I ask um, you to look at correlation coefficients, linear correlation coefficients between the winning percentages and runs scored and the winning percentages and runs allowed. And what were these correlations and which was stronger based on this data? And I told you about Bill James' Pythagorean theorem of baseball, and I asked, was this a stronger correlation? And I talked about a team being lucky if they won more, a higher percentage than that, and otherwise they were unlucky. Who was luckiest? And uh, I also asked you the question, does this correlation, in this case, imply causation? Okay. Uh, this is what you should have gotten for uh, this, and the tail is going uh, out uh, outright, and so that's uh, saying it's a little bit skewed. So it's skewed right or positive based on that. <clears throat> you also maybe could have interpreted that if you had had one uh, altogether um, box plot, but I didn't. I asked you to look at those separately, and so what you see is that let's see the American League is is is, is uh, this no I think the Ameri actually it's in this order the American League is the blue and the National League is this and you can see what happens is that you can make a case that wow there are more runs scored in the American League and that's because they had a designated hitter instead of having a pitcher batting uh, I ask you to compute those correlations so between runs and winning percentages this is what you should have gotten between runs allowed and this, notice that this is negative because the fewer runs you allow, the higher your winning percentage should be. But Bill James' thing was much better, uh, you know, the Pythagorean theorem that I told you about. And uh, let's see. Oh, the other thing I uh, said, in this case, I think a case can be made for the correlations having something to do with causation. Because if you score a whole bunch of runs, you're more likely to win a game. And if you have really good defense or pitching, don't allow many runs, you would tend to win more games. Uh, I did sort them uh, based on the difference between Bill James' uh, coefficient and their winning percentages. And in this year, the San Diego Padres were the luckiest team uh, because this was, that, that was um, the, uh, the biggest number and it was positive, which means they were lucky. And uh, we saw that that year, like so many years, the White Sox and Cubs were unlucky. Uh, we did a problem dealing with the counties of Illinois, and I gave you a database. Now, this was maybe uh, one of the more challenging problems I gave you because you had to do a lot of massaging with data because this is what the data looked like. It, wasn't in, it was in alphabetic order. This didn't help you at all having the square miles here, and you really didn't care about having these kilometers squared. So you had to do a bunch of cleaning up of the data, and um, this actually took quite a while to do. And I realized that, but you should understand that you don't always find data the way you want to find it, and grooming the data often is required. I asked you a whole bunch of questions, and by the way, these are good questions, and I was asking you the questions about the population density, so you had to, had to take the population divided by the density in square miles. So I asked you to find the mean standard deviation pieces, the five-number summary, the highest z-score, the lowest z-score, the most extreme county name, uh, either high or low, the upper fence, the lower fence, skewness of the data, and uh, there's a lot of stuff here. This might be, this is, it is actually a very good problem for you to know how to do. Okay, so after you scrubbed all that data and there was a lot of work doing it, uh, one of the things I did was I um, sorted uh, the data uh, according to the density that I calculated. The lowest density uh, county was Pope County, and the highest one was Cook County because it has Chicago. And if you start looking at the uh, uh, the um, Z scores, you'll see that uh, what happens is um, down here you get a very well. In fact, let's talk about how the data is distributed. There's a whole bunch of things that are small, and then you got Cook, DuPage, and maybe one other county that's uh, that's up here. So you see this is skewed right, and it, you really have a squished up um, box plot as well. Uh, if you count all, uh, all these things, that was the mean. Now, this is a population because this is all counties in uh, Illinois, so that's what you got for that. Here's the five-number summary. Oh, here's the z-score for Pope County was minus 0 0.29 and so on and so forth. But look, 
Cook County was eight and a half standard deviations above the mean. So clearly that was the giant in the room. And finishing second, but way behind, was DuPage County and then Lake County. Uh, the skewness index was this. And I think those are all the questions. Oh, here's the upper and lower fences. Uh, this is a good problem. These are questions I really could ask you. Very likely will. And I already told you about Herbie's GPA. This was the video where I told you the solution to that previously. And I would encourage you to look at all the other videos. And these are journaled in the announcements on Blackboard. So you can go all the way back to the beginning of the term and find out what happened on what day. And Linda's study guide in Blackboard is also certainly worth a look. Uh, Linda's talented list, and actually Linda's talented at many things. This is what her study guide looked like, and I gave her uh, the draft of the exam, so she was looking at that when she did this. Uh, more later on administrative testing protocols and uh, processes, and not only Linda, but the Learning Commons uh, math assistance area has a lot of availability. And uh, don't forget about Tom Topol, who's doing a DM a uh, service for our class specifically. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious, each day must count, do the math, it will make you strong. Now more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. God bless you all.